uh, continue to ask the student to what you think uh, fourth wave of fascism is and what does it want? Right. So before we go on to the fourth wave of feminism and discussing who is a part of it and who is not, who is participating, who is not, and who is being ignored, and whether they're successful or not, I think it's important to recognize or to start this discussion by discarding the wave metaphor for the act of universally compartmentalizing and somewhere reducing feminism to four waves. So it's important to note that when we use the wave metaphor to define feminism, we are restricting a discussion to the West, particularly the United States of America. And even then, the act of dividing the movement into four distinct sections is a monolithic and even a reductionist approach to a movement that is premised on inclusion. When you're speaking about inclusion and then segregating something so inclusive and diverse into four waves, we're not doing justice to it. The four waves, which theoretically um, range from the suffrage movement in the 1850s to Me Too and Body Neutrality in, say, 2018, describe feminism in the USA. However, in India, if you were to divide feminism into such sections based on time and circumstance, we could do it by dividing feminism into three phases, ranging from the pre-independence era in the 1850s to the 10th fire plan in 2002, and when we were first introduced to the concept of gender budgeting and redistribution of public resources, right? So even if we do not discard the way of metaphor, because that is the premise of our discussion, we will have to acknowledge that the way of metaphor, the four ways of feminism, cannot be adopted as a means to understanding feminism in the global south and in developing countries. Because in developing countries, women's oppression, class segregation looks much different than, than it does in, say, America and in the West. In the West, they have racial segregation, they have caste segregation. Those are not two comparable concepts. In, um, in Middle Eastern countries, for instance, property rights have not really been uh, the bone of controversy and discourse. And it is not what discourse has been directed towards when it comes to feminism, right? Property rights was more of an issue in the West than the Middle East. In the Middle East, feminism is more about social, uh, social status and power dynamics that women are, um, that, that we are exposed to as women. Right now, speaking about what the fourth wave wants. Again, I, I really, as a feminist myself, I do not uh, believe in the wave metaphor, and I have considerably discarded it myself. But if we were to speak about the fourth wave as, um, say, after the 2000s, then the fourth wave, what it's looking like we want is inclusion, right? So the fourth wave, feminism today is significantly more inclusive than it used to be. That, that is one thing that we can accept, regardless of whether. Uh, we believe that they failed or not, right? So feminism today is significantly more inclusive than it used to be, but, but we're still not making significant progress, right? For one, our movement, if they are so, if we are to call our movement, movement, they are largely reactionary, right? There is a lack of consistency, that there is a lack of sustained resistance and organized opposition. We're not organized, we're not coordinated. It is very, even if we are, even if we are um, basing our feminism on distinct issues, we're not following it up. Our protests do not translate into any material, tangible, long-term change, right? For instance, the, the recent Rhea Chakrabarti incident, only a week ago, it was everywhere, right? So regardless of whether you consume entertainment news or not, whether you follow the film industry in India or not, it was pretty much in your face. Right? And now, I do not even hear about it. Rhea Chakraborty was harassed. There were smear campaigns against her. It was a largely politicized issue. And a number of feminist outlets even released statements about it. Right? They, they released statements in favor of Rhea Chakraborty. One outlet I remember distinctly was the Swaddle. And now, a week later, there is no conversation about it, neither about mental health, nor about drug abuse, nor about the, dehumanize, the, uh, the dehumanization of women and the targeting of women. We are not speaking about this any longer. It was only, it was more like a weak incident for us. It was a one-off 
And what we did in that time, along with the media, is destroy the woman's life. We pretty much destroy the woman's life, and we have now moved on. Right? She's not in the news. She's not in the news. She's not in our conversation. She's in prison, and we're not even doing anything about it. We're not, we're not even talking about it. We're not even talking about what, what led to all of this and what uh, the fallacies in our system are. And if you don't talk about it, it will continue. This will happen to some other woman tomorrow. But today, feminism, or the fourth wave feminism, has clearly failed the Riyadh Chakraborty. We have not fought for her, and, we have, and even if we have, we have not had any kind of um, systematic approach to our fight. So overall, I, I feel fourth wave, or whatever it is, after the 2000s, feminism after the 2000s, has not been even half as organized and even half as, um, even half as planned as feminism before the 2000s was. And that is partly because they're being very reactionary and they're picking up one incident, not following, up, not following it up, not doing anything about it. The only technology, technology has not really made us more effective feminists, more solution-oriented feminists if there are any solutions to our issues at all. That is also me. Yes. Yes, yes. And that was, uh, you know, pretty much up to the point. And uh, you also told like what exactly the fourth wave is expecting from us and where we are heading towards. Um, okay, so this is taking me uh, to the next question. Uh, this, uh, this question, do you think why feminism is important today? Uh, you are mute, I guess. Oh. I'm sorry again. Um, nowadays, um, I think um, feminism is much more important, especially nowadays. In a, uh, we're using most uh, all the time technology, just like just like what uh, Pragya were, was talking about earlier. Um, technology has taken place uh, most of the time now. It's in the what should women do nowadays, especially when I, I'm working in a tech company and uh, how the leadership of women now being um, um, on this, in this kind of uh, field where it used to be, it is a male dominated field. So um, the importance of feminism right now is the women and the power uh, in this 21st century, and there is is a much more meaning, much more meaning to the lives of every every woman. So, um, one of the examples of uh, keeping uh, making the the voice of women at the moment, especially using the the social media, uh, the technology in this fourth wave feminism. Um, it really does uh, make a big voice to, to, to the whole world. Uh, let's say, for example, using this hash trending hashtag, uh, for instance, this uh, Me Too movement, which really speaks um, uh, uh, what for years had been uh, being uh, not included or not being talked about in the society. So um, feminism and with the uh, with uh, women who are really voicing their voice about the rights of women is has given a lot has given um has given this a lot of opportunity for women to get to show their right and to show their that they have this space in the society not only for men. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, now I just want to take uh, this question ahead. Like as we are talking about today's feminism, uh, I would love to ask this question to my three. What do you think is the biggest problem in today's feminism? I think in today's feminism, like what uh, you know, Alolika rightly said that we are not organized and it's just it is right there. But there needs to be a proper structure to it. And if we are endorsing. Uh, a movement, you know, a movement needs to 
be very clearly directed you know and there has to be it has to be solution oriented it has to we need to have more platforms where we know how to you know put in put like take thing from the start to the end and that is something that we are missing in today's time in today's you know when we are endorsing this particular uh, concept another thing is that uh, like i earlier said that everyone has made feminism into this man hating concept you know into this and it is as if this movement is anti men and uh, so the thing is it is it is somewhere tarnishing the purpose of the movement it is unnecessarily turning a lot of you know a lot of voices which are you know in general they they are someone who endorse it in their everyday lives but it is turning them into uh, believing that this this movement is uh, just going one sided and uh, yeah. whereas it is just talking about equality and unnecessary there is this uh, bad feminism coming coming in there is this whole um uh, it's unnecessarily tarnishing the whole movement and the purpose of the movement and that is something is a huge problem that i realize because i get to work with a lot of young young people who work with us as volunteers and with the age group of say you know 17 18 and it's this is i'm giving you examples from everyday lives that um you know there are such nice compassionate empathetic boys that i come across and i'm i'm very happy that uh they they are not afraid of sh- showing their vulnerable sides and uh, all of that but when it comes to their regular conversation and when it is about their relationships or or um uh, you know or just in uh, general about girls the whole conversation is so one sided and it has become as if um uh, and there is so much hating that i could sense from their uh, regular conversation that is when i realized that Uh, how they when they talk about feminism or if you are just in generally talk, discussing the topic so that is when i realized that this needs to stop we need we need to change the dialogue we need to um, uh, and we need to tell everyone that what you know this is the kind of uh, this should be our language when we talk about feminism it is not it is not a man hating concept so i often tell this that yeah. if i say i am a feminist it doesn't mean that i hate men it doesn't it i i'm not saying that men are uh, you know men are bad or whatever whatever the whole you you understand what i'm saying so we need to fix this somewhere and this i don't i don't really have like i what alolika said i don't know what the solution to this is and discourses like this because this concept is finally becoming culturally relevant and um, there are cultural discourses happening on this it has to happen the right way like we are sitting here and we are talking about it now alolika gave me a different perspective pragya gave me a different perspective it just added on to my understanding of the word and it is giving me more clarity we need to now find and fix this uh, understanding of what feminism is in general society has this understanding that it is a completely female concept and uh, it talks about Uh, it is just about a bunch of women who are, uh, you know, with, with tattoos on their bodies, and these are the kind of women who uh, are the flag bearers of feminism. So the, this perception needs to change. This perception is the problem of the movement, and the right kind of dialogue over this may be able to fix this. And again, we need proper channels. We need proper. Uh, solutions uh, and uh, you know at the policy level uh, when when we can actually take this whole movement and be able to uh, you know take it to a point where it gets incorporated into a law or it gets there are policies being designed around it you know to bring bring us together on on, on the same platform is something that will uh, fix this somehow it's a long road it's it's not going to be easy but yeah it has to be more solution oriented and it it is that it's we should not only be talking about it in a generalized manner that oh this is feminism is this feminism is that we need equality but as an individual if i'm i'm demanding equality i need to like i i need to start from my home i need to tell my my mom that you know it, it should be like i'm demanding things on an equal platter starting from my own home 
and that is how slowly we need to induce the idea into the system we need to start by introducing more uh, you know gender equal concepts through our textbooks that is where we need to start from you know do you realize how many fairy tales are uh, 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 gender biased we need to start by you know what kind of story books are we uh, reading to our children what kind of uh, lessons are we having in our curriculums in school so it has to start from there and that is when we will be able to somehow act and uh, you know bring about a change in a whole generation so we need to start uh, at that level yeah that's that's pretty much true i just loved how you touched the concept of not in from the seven me or in your curriculum that is how you know if you My mother was a single parent, and uh, she she had me when she was very very young, when she was only about seventeen years old. A teen mom, and back in the day, uh, not you know just having completed her tenth standard, and she really paved her way uh, into a man's world, as, as as you know she called it, and became a successful entrepreneur today. uh you know almost three decades after her separation uh she is who she is and she uh is, is a very sort of a strong personality and uh, you know i mean uh, work is very important to her but there are many aspects of her life in which her stance is very different from what somebody who would superficially know her uh you know would probably say that oh she's maybe being regressive or she's um you know why is she taking the soft stand in terms of is she encouraging patriarchy uh, after everything that she went through is she not siding with women is she not siding with girls and she has uh, you know her own set of views so it's basically about thriving together and complementing each other wherever we are because we are very very diverse and different in place so feminism how i may feel it to be today may not be the same when i wake up tomorrow because at the end of the day i feel that human beings at the heart are extremely selfish 
species and we are species of convenience and we keep using uh, you know situations uh, conveniently as we go like i uh, you know i've been working in this space of sexual harassment child sexual abuse marital abuse and i myself have gone through uh, sexual harassment at the workplace and when i called out everybody that i thought was responsible at the workplace also sort of lending uh, my voice to say a few other colleagues of mine who confided in me about what they went through uh being women when it actually came out in the open every single woman cut me out they were hostile to me they stopped speaking to me uh they wouldn't even look me in the eye and completely backed out and they were the same bunch of women who would talk about feminism who would talk about uh you know leading movements and you know being at the top of you know your careers and not having to work and not doing how to be really quite a friendly woman uh, you know that people conventionally understand so uh, when these experiences shape your life uh, as a woman today do we really blindly Have faith in or believe in the power of change uh, collectively, uh, you know, under the umbrella of women. Just because we are all women, probably not. Because you know, you will meet uh, women. Like I, um, you know, to some extent, I do not agree with the fact that uh, it's only patriarchy. Uh, patriarchy, yes, but it's only men who are sort of responsible for driving this narrative home. It's not. It's it's also women. And I think we must understand that. Uh, just cuz like like you may have friends who would be absolutely okay with not having careers and uh, having completely domesticated lives you may have women who uh, would definitely not think about sitting at home and would go out there and like conquer the world and you know they want to do politics or they want to do uh, entrepreneurship or whatever it is and it's perfectly all right just cuz i feel that something is lacking in my life or i feel that i'm subjected to certain set of opportunities uh that maybe somebody else is not or if i want to change something in my environment purely based on my gender and the situations that i'm experiencing doesn't have to mean the same for the other person so i think if you really want to uh stir up conversation about feminism uh, you have to first of all address it in an extremely inclusive manner like i take workshops on sexual harassment sexual abuse uh with a mixed group of people it's extremely gender inclusive also is inviting women to be victims of sexual abuse and sexual violence but it's important to include every stakeholder in the discussion and although men may not be directly benefiting from feminism well i think they are benefiting if women are put on equal footing or rather if if you know if women are given uh, opportunities purely based on their capabilities merit education and not because uh, uh, you know we define women by their bodies so we limit women by uh, you know their um, the families that they come from or the religion that they uh, practice or the clothes that they wear then i think the world will be a much more inclusive and better place so really it's about uh, understanding each other really really like you know somebody i think my three said in the in the beginning that i'm really happy to be here because it's women supporting other women and the first thought that came to my mind that that's perhaps there and uh, it's true because you know we we really do we really feel uh, connected with each other like uh, you know this uh, this lady uh, kimberly uh, i'm forgetting her last mm-hmm. name yeah yes she she had no coined the term. yeah she coined the term intersectionality i think in 1989 and she explained it so beautifully so she took the example of a black woman and she said that you are black but you're not a woman okay so you don't understand the problems of a black woman you could be a woman but you're not black and then again you don't understand the problems of a black woman because you have to be at the intersection of being black and being a woman to really fully comprehend the problem so i think we are doing a useless exercise by solving problems that we don't fully understand to begin with so uh, that's where i think the armchair feminism and the white supremacy feminism or the online activism kicks in because uh, it's a choice you can be an online uh, feminist you can be an offline feminist you can be a grassroots feminist you can be a policy level feminist wherever you are but i think that you need to make it relevant uh, for yourself first and foremost so that you don't confuse people and when you really believe in making it relevant you will see that change right through to the end and not leave it midway and not just create some sort of 
you know, gas around it by talking about it and then drop it uh, like a hot potato. So I really think that uh, to just, you know, add to what Alodika said about having a coordinated movement, I think we should take one step back and before we can have a coordinated movement, let's be coordinated and thought with ourselves and really understand that as women, what do we want? Uh, because there are some 10, 15 different schools of feminism. Do I even fit in one? I can want to have, uh, you know, to make a difference and make a, make a change uh, or, you know, elevate women's uh, rights or work for gender equality, even if I don't fit into any of those groups of feminism. So we need to discard terminologies and we understand uh, some of groups of people that, you know, we are dealing with. And you have to, you know, you understand that where you stand, uh, like I call it a pseudal experiment. Where do you stand? Uh, where do you fall in that pyramid of privilege, you know, and, and then sort of look at uh, who are you really uh, speaking about and speaking to. So if I were to really address this problem, uh, I think for me, first and foremost would be to understand a certain group of women that think alike, feel alike, want the same thing, and then really walk backwards from there. Okay. Yes. And every point uh, that you mentioned is remarkable and we really need to work upon each of it because if you want to kind of explain the concept and, you know, bring the right concept of feminism to the world, I think each of this point needs to be worked upon remarkably. So just thank you so much. And again, uh, I guess I need to end the meeting and we need to join again and we'll move towards the end of the session since it's already six. So I just request everyone to uh, kind of leave the meeting and join in once again.